All right, everybody, we're back here with uh, Unquestionable with Calvin Smith, and I have a returning guest. It's one of my first returning guests of the show so far, and it's Dr. Greg Little. And uh, he was on recently, uh, actually last season he was on, and we talked a little bit about Atlantis and Bimini Road and his adventures at uh, the Andros Island in the Bahamas and a couple other locations in that area. And uh, this time I wanted to talk a little bit with... Uh, Dr. Little about his book, Mound Builders. Um, But before we get into mound builders and what exactly mounds are and the significance of them, uh, Dr. Little, thanks again for coming on the show. Thank you, Calvin. Uh, It's a pleasure. Uh, I'm surprised I'm one of your first returning guests, if not the first. Uh, That's an honor. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've got a couple people lined up, but you know, you were the first one to jump on and you know, you were the, you know, first come first serve. And you know, I loved our first conversation. So I just felt a need to have you on to talk something with you because I just thought my audience really highly enjoyed our first interview. And um, I still get comments on it today about how, um, how, informational it was so uh, yeah i felt the need you would be the perfect guest to come back on so i do appreciate thank you. you coming um, oh, thank you yeah so i guess before we get into like mound builders and stuff has there been anything new come forward about like bimini road or anything like that uh the bimini road no the bimini road remains uh kind of controversial uh i can say this the the mm-hmm. history channel has uh remixed a series that we did in 2012. Uh, We did two shows on Mystery Quest. And one of the, in both of those, we started out at Bimini and we went to the Bimini Road. We did a lot of underwater archaeology in that area. And then we went a lot of other places. Um, And we have added to that, uh, to this remix of the show, which they're going to release sometime this summer. Uh, we added uh, the what's called Brown's Ruins. It was a discovery that we made about 30 miles south of Bimini of what looks like a building structure, actually a temple that is collapsed. Uh, I don't know if we talked about that last time or not. I don't think but, so. No, okay. I, don't, I don't recall that. Well, we, f- we found a lot in the Bahamas um, and Bimini, the Bimini Road is it's a 1600 foot long J shaped formation. All right. So if you can visualize it, think of a long line and then a J and it serves as a breakwater. The ocean waves come in and of course it's underwater now, but four, four, five, six, seven thousand years ago, it was not underwater. Uh, And it is a multi-tiered level of stones, giant blocks. Many of them are square and rectangular. A lot of them are irregular. And of course, they've been there a long time and they've had a lot of erosion, but it's not just the bottom there. It isn't, that's for certain. But it's been so controversial since it was discovered in 1968. We really had no intention of ever going to it. That was a long involved story at Andros. Uh, The last thing we did at Andros was look at a place called the Andros Platform. And it looks sort of like the photos and film that we had seen of what is known as the Bimini Road. And I remember kind of shaking my head and putting my hand in my head like this going, oh my God, we've got to go look at the Bimini Road now (laughs) because that's kind of the kiss of death. You have all the skeptics attacking you the moment that you taught that you even look at it you just have to accept what they've said that it's just the bottom uh or it's beach rock bottom and just let it go but we didn't we we spent a lot of time looking at it um it's it's an ancient breakwater it does not go back to atlantis in other words it's not twelve thousand years old the actual the formation the bimini road or bimini wall as some people call it uh was formed around maybe 6,000 years ago. And what that means is that we believe there was an unknown maritime culture operating in that region. There is a similar formation to both the Bimini Road and the Andros platform at K-Sal. K-Sal is a small, eh, I I don't know how many islands are there, maybe two kind of large ones and then several small ones. Uh, and it's about 30 miles from Cuba, from Havana. And we have been there. Uh, there is a, a formation that looks exactly 
like the Andros platform, except it's got like six giant blocks laying on top of each other. And it's a long formation. So it's like a huge block on top of that is another block on top of that. And then it's real long and it's very clear that was a breakwater. Now they're not, they're not concrete. They're made out of regular stone that is found on these islands, but they've been cut to, to, to place. And it's been there a long time. And so all this these stones weigh. do you know? How well, much I, that I can't tell you. I have moved okay. some of the Bimini road stones. Uh, I, I don't know of anybody that's ever said the weight of them. I can tell you what Andros we measured a lot of them there and andro stones are the biggest of any of them so what they are the largest ones are 25 feet long wow they are about 14 feet wide and a foot and a half to two feet thick yeah that's massive they're made out of a limestone limestone beach rock is what they are made out of uh, and that it's several layers of them. Now, that's kind of the largest one. There's actually a long line of these, and they're all very uniform. They're about a foot and a half to two feet thick. They are very square and rectangular, perfectly straight edges between them, roughly 12 to 15 feet long, 10 feet wide. There's loads of those, and there's three lines of those at Andros, three of them all underwater, uh, in this area where they actually kind of ring around a really deep spot that we believe was a harbor in ancient times. The thing people need to remember that they don't remember, they think that people maybe 10,000 years ago, 12,000 years ago, didn't know anything about sailing. It was too dangerous for them to go and all that. What people don't know, during the last ice age, with the sea level so much lower, three to 400 feet lower, and the Earth's temperatures were cooler, pilots know this, pilots know that the colder the air is, the more stable it is. The warmer the air is, the more unstable it is. So you have really bad winds and storms when it's warm outside, but you don't have very much when it's really cold. So it was right, a much right. easier time to travel. Gotcha. Yeah, well, that kind of, that's super interesting. I in, I encourage anyone who hasn't listened to mine and Dr. Little's first interview, you definitely should listen to that and get the full story on Bimini Road because there's a ton that we went over in our first interview that you know we haven't even touched on yet that really blew my mind that I wasn't aware of at the time. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I encourage everyone who hasn't listened to the first interview, definitely, definitely take a listen to the full thing. Um, but that kind of leads me into the topic for today where I wanted to talk about mounds in America. Um, now, as I said before, I have been reading your book, Mound Builders, ah, and yeah. uh, it's a super insightful. Like literally from the first page, it's had me hooked. Um, I've been reading it all week, wow. trying to finish it before our interview. Still got like two chapters left. So I'm almost there. I'll probably end up finishing it today. But yeah, I, the whole basis of the book seems to be of these, uh, the predictions that Edgar Casey made in the, I believe it was the 1900s, that, um, yeah, that essentially human civilization goes back tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years further than the common consensus may make. Um, so could you kind of elaborate a little bit on what exactly Edgar Casey was talking about when he mentioned mounds in America and the connection between that and the Atlanteans? Sure. Uh, well, first, let me tell you how that book came about. One of the authors on that book, the second author is John Van Auken. John is one of the directors at the Casey organization, the ARE. The other author is my wife, uh, and she she also has a doctorate. By the way, call me Greg. Um, Greg. <laughs> uh, my wife also has a doctorate. She uh, served on the board of trustees of the ARE for I don't know how many, many years, and then served as the chairperson of the board for almost three years. Uh, but during, before that, and during the time, we wrote a lot for the Casey organization. And back in, that book is 20 years old. That Mound Builder book is 20 years old. Uh, we've talked about adding a few little updates to it. Um, but here's how it came about. Back then, John Van Auken was one of the directors of the ARE, and we went on a tour with he and his wife into uh, the Yucatan. It was the first time that we had been on one of these tours with them. Um, and 
we we talk quite a bit on it and particularly with his wife and somewhere along the line john sat down with us and he said uh nobody has ever looked at any of the readings that edgar casey made on mounds indian mounds because he knew i was the mound person that i was really into indian mounds at the time and i said really i said edgar casey said something about indian mounds i was shocked and he said, yeah, he may, he had quite a few readings about Indian mounds. And he said, but nobody's ever looked into them. And I know that, you know, the current archeological status. I mean, I knew the mainstream. I was pretty much mainstream at the time in my beliefs. And he said, why don't you look at them and compare them against what we know today? So that's how it all started. And then it, it expanded as I got into this, it expanded and John and my wife got involved and I was surprised by it. So Casey, Edgar Casey, the greatest American psychic back in uh, around 1900, he, 1901 or so, he began giving psychic readings. Almost all of them were on health, health and personal issues that people had. Uh, by around 1920 or so, the readings had expanded and were in other topics also. He often gave readings then starting in 1923 that told people that they had past lives. And that is how Indian Mounds entered into all this. Some of the people, when he was describing their past lives, had interactions with Native Americans or were, or were Native Americans themselves. Now, maybe, maybe I need to say this now. The big difference between Edgar Casey and like the theosophists, like Madame Blavatsky, mm -hmm. uh, Elliot, I can't, uh, can't remember his first name. He's got a hyphenated last name, Scott Elliot. Uh, and then there's several others. They all talk about the Atlanteans as, I hate to say it, it's horrible, the white race. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because that, you know, as soon as you, as soon as you say that white supremacy, bad stuff, you can't, yeah, yeah. but Edgar Casey back in 19, in the 1920s said point blank, the Atlanteans were the red race and the Atlanteans mm -hmm. that escaped the final destruction of Atlantis went up in mass to the Northeast of the United States and became the Iroquois tribe. Now we're talking about 12 to 13,000 years ago, this took place, 12 to 13,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. So Casey said they were the red race and they decided as they went to different areas of the United States and North America and so on. And there were some of them that went down to South America. They made mounds and pyramids to simulate and imitate the structures that they had built in Egypt and the Gobi Desert, the Gobi Desert, and Atlantis itself. The pyramids, the structures were all made to imitate those, the Atlantean, the whole Atlantean lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Casey gave 58 readings that mentioned Indian mounds. And so when I collected those 58 readings, we began to look at exactly what they said. There were dates that he gave in a lot of those, like when the first people came in, when migrations, Casey talked about migrations coming across the Bering Strait coming in. And that really wasn't known at the time. And the dates that he gave when things went on uh, just surpassed everything mainstream archaeology would say. In 1923, for example, the Clo Clovis had not been found. It was believed then that Native Americans entered the Americas maybe around 6,000 years ago. Gotcha. That was the mainstream belief then. Right. Now, when they discovered the Clovis points in New Mexico in 1927, I believe, in, 19, in early 1930, when they dated them, they decided that the Native Americans came in with the Clovis people, and that was around, uh, give or take, 10,000 B.C., uh, 9,700 is one of the dates that they throw around all the time, but 10,000 BC, so 12,000 years ago. So that kind of matches up with Casey's idea that the Atlanteans fled to the Northeast around 12,000 years ago. But Casey made it very plain. There were already people here. <laughs> yeah, there yeah. were people everywhere in the Americas, North America and South America. In fact, we know the oldest known mound 
in the Americas right now. And that's not in that book. It's actually in that Denisovan Origins, which I believe you have. Do you have the book Denisovan Origins? I think so. Yeah, I do think you okay. sent me that one. Yeah. In that, it, there's a, it talks about the oldest known mound in the Americas, and it's actually in Brazil. It dates to 8,400 BC, so it's uh, 10,400 years old. But in that area, we know there are other mounds that haven't been tested that are probably older. Uh, so it's, it's all getting very interesting. But okay, so Casey's 58 readings broke into all different kinds of areas, everything from when the Norse came in, he talked about the Norse yeah. coming in. He talked about swords that were discovered. Uh, I think that's in the later chapters. I don't know if you've gotten to that. Yeah, I actually, it was, oh, okay. it was on my there list of stuff to ask is, is that you lightly touch on the, the Vikings reaching America hundreds yeah. of years before Columbus. And uh, right. so just, what, what were the Vikings doing here? Well, the Vi I mean, all that's well known. The Vikings settled in Newfoundland around 10, I think it was around 1015 or 1020, the year 1015. So a long time before Columbus, almost 500 years before yeah. Columbus showed up. Uh, but the Vikings, there are people like in Minnesota who believe like the Kensington runestone is genuinely a Viking artifact. And the Kensington runestone is actually translated to say that a group of Vikings came in and there actually is a route into this area in Minnesota through Canada down into Minnesota. And they settled there for a while, but they were attacked by the red men, uh, Atlanteans. Oh, there you go. They yeah, were attacked yeah. by the Atlanteans and most of them were killed. Some of them made it back, but they actually wrote this on this giant Kensington runestone, which okay. is still there. Uh, and you can see it. It's in a museum. So that was in there. Casey never mentioned the Kensington runestone, but there was an artifact that had popped up that was a sword believed to be a Viking sword that was found in that area. Casey's reading. This is this is probably one. I had this discussion yesterday with someone in a like a six hour road trip that we took. <laughs> um, and it was about Edgar Casey being wrong in some of his readings. And I was asking this person who is very much into Casey, also a speaker there, about how do they explain the fact that there are several readings where we know for certain that Edgar Casey was wrong in what he said during that reading. Uh, and this sword is one of the things that Casey said that was wrong. It's a hoax. The sword was planted. We know that for certain. Uh, yeah. They know the people that did it and so on. Uh, but what Casey said in the reading is that it was a genuine Viking sword. So I don't know if it was a genuine Viking sword that was planted as a hoax for it uh, or whatever. That I right. don't know. Uh, and there is there are ways that I explain Casey being wrong, but that's actually that's pretty deep. Uh, and that would take the rest of the hour if we get into that. Yeah, yeah, that makes OK. That's super interesting. Yeah, see, like I didn't know that the Vikings were actually... I guess attacked by the supposed red race. Oh, and now the the Vikings had lots of had lots of yeah. uh, interactions, and we know they had some friendly interactions in Newfoundland and Canada with what we call today the First Peoples, but they had some very dangerous interactions too. And they finally kind of lived with themselves, didn't interact very much with the natives, uh, and the natives we know that they were very hostile to the whites coming in. When the, when the Spanish and the French and the Portuguese and the British all tried to come into North America, they were met host with lots of hostility and driven off. Yeah. And that's why it took the Spanish, like the Spanish sent an incursion in in, in 14, uh, not 92, 15, 1539, Hernando de Soto came in with 400, 400 soldiers I don't know how many dogs they had. I think they had a hundred attack dogs wow. and they had thousands of Indian slaves with them, which is something that's mm -hmm. not well known. They took all these slaves with them too in chains. Uh, and slavery is another issue that I, someday I'm really going to get into that because yeah. uh, slavery. Um, ah, okay. Let's, let's just, I'll get <laughs> off that. I, I have my on. own little issues that I'm ready to talk <laughs> about, but that's not here. Uh, yeah, that yeah. seems like a whole other. Oh, my God. But yeah. But it OK, like so an interesting one. Oh, yeah. So there's lots of interesting stuff in this. Anyway, so Casey said that the mound building began because of their their linkage to Atlantis. That's why they did it. 
there are thousands of mounds in America that are built like a pyramid. Mm -hmm. They're earth, most of them are earthen, but they're built like a pyramid. They have sides that go up. The difference here is we don't have them go all the way to the top and make a point. Right. There we take them up one. and then there's a flat top. Yeah. Like you see in Mexico, there's loads of these in Mexico. And in Mexico, they're not solid stone pyramids. They're not solid stone. Most of them were earthen mounds first, and then they put a superstructure over them mm -hmm. of stone. There were some of those in North America. There are several of those in North America, including some very, very large ones in Ohio that were covered with stone slabs very carefully. When the white settlers came in, uh, obviously they needed building material to build their houses and churches and schools and buildings. Yep. So they simply removed all these convenient building blocks off of these mounds and used them for construction, just as they often would need dirt to build up a road where it was going through low land or to put, you know, some some ground under a house. So they would conveniently go out and just dig all the dirt out of these mounds and use them. And they would find things in them. And usually that was thrown away, except for any artifacts that looked valuable. Yeah. OK. Yeah. I mean, that's. That seems reasonable because it, it, it makes me think of like, uh, you know, in Egypt, how, you know, Cairo is basically built from little pieces of, you know, structures. Right. And they think that like pieces of the pyramid and the Sphinx and stuff are used to build some of the regular commercial buildings in Cairo. And it's like, oh, right. geez, what a shame. But I know. Um, well, that, that's how it fits into Casey's thing that it's Casey said that they built these because of that, because of their their background in Atlantis and the Gobi, the Gobi fits into Casey's readings because some Atlanteans went there and they built some structures there, which actually have been found. And that, again, that's another whole story. Mm. Uh, but uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. So one mound that I particularly am really interested in because I'm pretty close to it and that you mentioned several times in Mound Builders and is the cover of Mound Builders is Serpent Mound. Mm -hmm. Serpent yeah. Mound, I just really learned about maybe a couple of years ago. Um, I was just looking for ancient sites that I could venture to, um, you know, here in Michigan and came across Serpent Mound. And then I found, you know, Graham Hancock talking about Serpent Mound and all these other you know, ancient tech and ancient civilization researchers talking about Serpent Mound. And what is the, the big deal with Serpent Mound? Why is uh, everyone well, it's so the large, interested in it? It's the largest, um, this is not true. Okay. Uh, I'll tell you what people have said about it and still say. They say sure. it's the largest earthen effigy uh, in the world. An effigy is uh, a lookalike for something. It could be a person. There are man mound. There's a man mound where it's a person. There's a mound that looks like a person. There's an alligator mound that's an effigy. There are loads of bear mounds and turtle mounds and all that. Uh, so, and there are lots of snake mounds. And uh, serpent mound is on the top of a, of a steep, steep, it's not exactly a mountaintop, but we'll call it that. Yeah. It's a flat mountaintop. And it has pretty much sheer sides in some areas. There is some weird stuff that goes on there, including me. I have witnessed some of that. Uh, it has uh, alignments to the solstices and the equinoxes, probably to the star, to some stars. Uh, it may be the constellation of Draco. There's a lot of... Uh, um, a lot of controversy about that, but it's a quarter mile long. So it's very, very large. And it looks just like an uncoiling rattlesnake yep. in its mouth. It looks like it has an egg. There's a little circular mound in its, in its mouth. And it's in a giant bowl. If you go miles and miles out, I think it's like 50 miles out. There was a meteorite that hit that millions of years ago and it blew it out kind of into a yeah, bowl. Right. And Serpent Mound sits right on the top of this promontory that I'm calling a mountain right in the middle where the thing hits. So it's electromagnetic. It's got certain magnetic properties to it. So it's all very unusual. By Serpent Mound, there are several bar small burial mounds which have been excavated. And when you go down to the farms, there are some small burial mounds there. And since you have an interest in it, that's why I'm telling you this. Uh, out of couple of the mounds at one of the farms at the base of Serpent Mound, when they were excavated, they pulled skeletons out that were seven to eight feet tall. 
So really? it, it, yes, it relates to the thing about giants and so on, the giants in the mounds. Hmm. Uh, I want to say very quickly that we did a lot of research on that and books on that too. That's what the, um, the book Path of Souls is about. Yeah, and the, the, we found there are lots of seven to eight foot skeletons that have been pulled out of mounds in America. There are, there are thousands of reports of much larger skeletons pulled from the mounds in America up to, in some cases, 15 to 20 feet, which would definitely be a very, very tall person. Yeah, that's um, Yeah, that'd be a basketball. Like, uh, makes me think of like the recently uncovered Dragon Man. Like I'm sure yes, you've heard of, of exactly. Dragon, Dragon Man. Dragon yeah. Man. Yeah, you need to get Andrew Collins on about that. Andrew's really- you know, I keep sending him emails and he keeps saying, I'll get back to you, I'll get back to you. And I get well, to we're waiting. And Andrew's my co-author <laughs> on this new book where he discusses Dragon Man. And what you got to realize that that book now comes out uh, in the United States. It's released. I think it's uh, May 13. They keep changing the date and it's oh, all man. delivery problems. It's it's yeah. paper, it's printing, it's getting books delivered and so on. But the publisher keeps changing the date. But it looks like now in the United States, it'll be due out. It'll come out uh, May 13th. Nice. I'll have to pre-order that. Uh, I can have you sent one from the publisher when they're available. Um, and I'll do that. Uh, so anyway, the <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> I hope so. Not well, actually I'm not, but anyway, <laughs> I can't so, take credit for that. Yeah. It, you made a whole chapter in mound builders talking about the Mississippians and the yes. pyramids, the, I guess, mound slash pyramids that they were making. What yeah. was so significant specifically about the Mississippian mounds rather than, I guess, other ones? Well, okay. So we just um, took a six day long excursion down looking at Mississippian mounds. Uh, in, they're named obviously for the Mississippi River. Mm. Uh, they were found throughout the, the Mississippian, it's an era. That's what it is. The earliest era of mound buildings is called archaic, and it just it goes through a series of them. The Mississippians uh, basically were about from the year 800 A.D. 800 till 1600 or so. Uh, they were still doing things in the year 1600. Those that were left that hadn't been destroyed by all the whites coming in. So they tended to build larger mounds. Here is a this is the book that the uh, Louisiana State Department of Archaeology puts out, the little booklet, mm. and how to go to some of their mounds. And see here, are some, can you see these? Yeah, yeah. I think these you have that picture couple, in your book. Yeah. Yes, I did. Uh, it's a government illustration. You can see they're very tall. They look like pyramids, and they put structures on them. So they have uh, this guidebook that actually, I don't think actually has a, no. And then, uh, here you go. This is a guide of some of the mounds in Louisiana, up and down wow, the Mississippi River. Those. And look That's at crazy. them. Now, those aren't individual mounds. Those are sites, some of which have a hundred mounds at them. Wow. And so we went up there on the uh, last week. Yeah, last week we were, we came up this whole side and we went down on the other side in, right. in um, Mississippi. And I suppose we probably saw 100 or 150. That's all we, we wanted to go to the very largest ones, ones that I did not have in my mound encyclopedia. Uh, I would, did I send you a mound encyclopedia? I don't think so. I don't think you sent me one of those. All right, let me grab some. <laughs> I'll show it to you. Paper. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. Oh my gosh, that's huge. <laughs> So there you go. You got a guest that's bailing out right in the middle of your show. <laughs> this. Did you get this? No, that You're is. You're kidding. No, that is. I can't awesome, believe I didn't send because I know I sent you something. Else. This is my uh, this is a, a giant hardback. Uh, and OK, so the Mississippian mounds, the reason that they are so interesting is, first of all, there were so many of them. Uh, and I'm just looking to show you a couple of uh is this for an audio recording of people or will they be able to see this too? This will be audio and video. It'll be on YouTube gotcha. too. Okay. Well, here's a site that we went to. I've been there many times. And so what you have yeah. here, this is in Mississippi. It's on the Natchez Trace. It is a federal site. 
this is a giant mound. I think it is uh, six acres on the top. Wow. And on the top of this giant mound, 30 feet tall, covering six acres, there were eight mounds. This one is 30 feet tall here. That's it's still insane. there. And the, the, it's hard to do this. The one on this, <laughs> end, the one on this end, uh, they pretty much removed. Uh, but this is just an example. And this right. was a uh, chief's uh, site. It was in the middle of uh, lots of houses in the middle of a, of a town or yeah. a city. Some of the cities had 20, 25,000 people in them. When Hernando de Soto came through in uh, 1439 to 14, uh, 1441 or so, they went up and down the Mississippi from roughly... Tennessee, where I'm in Memphis, from roughly Tennessee, they went down and they found village after village. After, it was just solid people. It's known now that when Columbus got here, there were probably 56 million people here. That's insane. And that's the <laughs> lowest estimate. That estimate doesn't come from uh, a crackpot. That estimate yeah. is straight out of mainstream archaeology. And a lot of them say that is way too low. It should be 150 million people. And yeah. it might have been 150 million. We don't know yet. It's just insane. Like that's what a lot of people don't seem to realize is that these mounds weren't just like little insignificant pointless things that people were building. Like these had purpose and large populations of people. So yes, they them. did. Yes, they did. This is one. This is a site that we went to this past week. Uh, there are there are 18 mounds. Here. That is a 50 foot tall mound there. It still wow. exists today. And you can see this is built. This is a fortress around the outside. They put a moat. It's on a river. And then on the inside, they build a wall and then they built a large palisade fort, a fortress. Wow. So you see those movies when I, I don't know, you're, you're still, you're quite a bit younger than me. So I don't know. You probably didn't watch the same kind of cowboy movies I did on Saturday and Sunday. I don't know. Probably, I don't know. All right. Well, you know, you see those movies and you'd see those palisade forts, which is like a palisade is a wooden log stuck in, in the ground. Yeah, 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 yeah. So they have all these wooden logs and then there's bastions there where they'd stand up and they had, that's how the Native Americans built their towns. Right. They did it. When the first whites came through, they discovered these fortresses all over the place. In fact, DeSoto attacked a number of these fortresses and burned them to the ground, killing thousands and thousands of people in the process. So that was all Native American. It was and because it's such a great thing to do, uh, it's the same thing the whites did. They just basically duplicated it. It's just insane. They're just the amount of people that were here and yet we're still saying that columbus discovered america i mean it's, oh well it's i know you know common. columbus never got here columbus <laughs> never <laughs> got out of the caribbean he never set foot in north america or central america columbus never set foot on it it's it's comical that you know, know. it's being passed off still in school textbooks and you know we it's just comical um and and <laughs> it's sad too because columbus what what really uh, isn't recognized when Columbus got in, he, he landed in the Bahamas and he made several trips and he went to all the islands. Uh, Cuba is one. They enslaved. And now this is the, the Spanish. This is part of the, the slavery thing. The Spanish, uh, the, the Portuguese, the French and all, they would immediately enslave the people as soon as they landed. And this went on. They were so friendly. And Columbus's log actually said that me and just a handful of man, men could enslave this entire population. And there were millions of people there. Cuba, ha Cuba has almost nothing known about it archaeologically for a couple of reasons. First of all, they systematically exterminated all the Tiano Indians. That's spelled T-A-I-N-O. That was the culture that was there. They systematically exterminated all of them. Even There's even a book written about the hunt for the last one. There was wow. one Native American that got away to the mountains, and there was a systematic hunt to try and find him and kill him. But between disease, enslavement, and then just outright genocide, murder, they got rid of all of them in all those areas. And there's almost no indigenous people that were from that culture. There are still some, I wanna make that plain, uh, but most of them fled to Central America. 
along the coastline there to survive. Yeah, it's it's so sad. You know, it's it's so sad to you know care about yeah. that and that that actually happened. You know, it's uh, so it's Casey sad. did talk about like, where these people come from. It's yeah. not just okay. So I just talked about ten thousand BC. Edgar Casey said that in fifty. I mean, it's very specific stuff. Casey said in fifty thousand BC. A large group of people came from the South Pacific and migrated in, and they came to South America and some of them moved up. That's, that was preposterous, absolutely preposterous when he said it in the 1930s. He also said that a couple of million years ago, there were people in the Southwest of America. When he said people, he said they weren't like us. It was a, a less advanced um, it was a less advanced type of human. And that's not really surprising, uh, even from Edgar Casey, because he said modern humans began around the year 210,000 BC. Yeah. 210, and that actually falls in line with what archaeologists had said for quite a few years that thoroughly modern humans, Homo sapiens sapiens, evolved around 210, 220,000 years ago. Now, all those timelines are thrown into disarray now as they keep discovering more and more, like, like you said, Dragon Man, they keep discovering more and more remains that are throwing things into disarray. So they don't yeah. exactly know. But we do know now that a group of people did come in from, from the South Pacific, probably around the same time frame as Edgar Casey said. And that comes from genetic evidence. There are people, yeah, there are people living in South America that have the exact same genes as the Aboriginal tribes do in Australia and New Zealand, and they are identical, and they have been there for a long, long time, and the mutation within the human genes that they have shows that they've probably been there a good 50 to 75,000 years. And that makes no sense at all to mainstream archaeology. Now, what we proposed yeah, in that book, in the Mound Builders book, remember that was like uh, 20 years ago. Right. In Denise of an Origins, a lot of that information was updated and we incorporated the newest information that was found. And we know that uh, it's, it's, it's definite, it's an absolute certainty that in those ancient times, 50, maybe 100,000 years ago, there were people moving around on the ocean and there is a southern route, which if you simply put a raft in the water, a big raft in the water, say at New Zealand, you will float along the edge of Antarctica and you will come up and you will hit the coast of Chile and you go right up the coast of South America. And if you simply, if you don't go to land, you'll go around and then a big circle, you'll go right back down around again. And that has been the circulation pattern, really, as far as they know, forever. Uh, that circulation pattern has been there a long time. So it, it's, it's a very easy journey from New Zealand to there, particularly during the last ice age, which, the, which began around 300,000 years ago. So all this, it makes perfect sense. There was a group of people that got in boats then. They probably were seafarers. They knew what they were doing. And they were exploring or maybe they were blown out, you know, blown by winds or something and they couldn't get back and they wound up in Chile and they went inland and they stayed. Yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, that that leads me into I, I was reading, you know, pretty close to the very beginning of your book. You talk yeah. about different native tribes in America having different haplogroups. Yes. Um, and you talk about this haplogroup X and the possibility that it may be left over from the Atlanteans and a very select people have this gene, yeah. I guess. Well, yes, there's a, maybe in, a, in the United States, non-Native Americans, but in us, people that are not Native American, uh, it might be one-tenth of one percent of us that have haplogroup X. So it is X and there's a reason for that. So let me, let me explain that quickly. Uh, the information in that book that was in the Mound Builders book, of course, is 20 years ago. And Haplogroup X was discovered in 1997. So we got it in that book. I think, I think the copyright date of the Mound book is 2000, I believe, yeah. or maybe 2001. I can't recall right now. It'd be on the first page or the, the copyright page. 
So all the 2001. All, okay, so that was written not too long after haplogroup X was discovered. So let me explain what it was. In 1994, actually in 1992 is when the research started. In 1992, the federal government gave these huge grants to several universities that had really good genetics departments. The main one is Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. Emory is an amazing school. Uh, Emory has a great genetics department, and what they were tasked with doing was testing Native American tribes for to see if they could determine why certain diseases were rampant in the Native American tribes. For example, uh, and there's a reason I get into all this. Back some years ago, I write it, wrote a textbook on obesity with a uh, physician who was an expert in obesity. And in that, we got into the genetics of obesity. And one of the interesting things, the most obese group in the world of any ethnic group that is morbidly obese, overweight, group having babies born obese with diabetes, which is virtually unheard of, and the group that has the highest incidence of diabetes in the world. And it's like one out of every four babies born there has diabetes. And we're talking about type two, which is not where you're, right, where you're right. not producing insulin. It's like from being basically from being obese is what, what causes it. Yeah. But anyway, it's the Pima Indian tribe in Arizona, that one tribe, and it's been a mystery for years. What is going on with this one tribe? So that is part of my interest in it. And it started years ago. And so that's why I got into that research. I knew it was on Native Americans going, OK, maybe they figured this out. They were also interested in the Blackfoot tribe, which is in the far north. And they're called the Blackfoot tribe because, well, they, they blacken their feet, but they have several disorders also, including one on their feet. So they were trying to figure this out in genetics. So what they did is they went in, they got thousands of tribal members to agree to give them samples. And in those samples, they tested two types of DNA. One type of DNA is what is known as human DNA or nuclear DNA. It's found in almost all of our cells. When I say almost all, the only ones it's not found in is red blood cells. DNA is not in your red blood cells. Mm -hmm. They have a different purpose, but it's in everything else. So DNA is in the nucleus. DNA uh, makes RNA. RNA makes the cells. That's what that's what duplicates everything in our body. However, there's another type of DNA in our body too, and it's called mitochondrial DNA. Mitochondrial DNA. A single one is called a mitochondrion. A mitochondrion is a uh, or an organelle is what is what genetics calls them. They are shaped kind of like a football. They look like a little football. Mm -hmm. When they are full, that is when they are consuming something, they consume sugar. When they consume sugar, they actually get bigger. <laughs> kind of like our right, belly gets right. bigger when we eat too much. And so they consume sugar. And then when they ha have consumed it, just like we do, we have byproducts. We go to the toilet. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they do too. And when they so they consume sugar and their waste product is a substance called ATP, adenotriphosphate. And adenotriphosphate is the very specific thing that our body uses for energy. People say that it's like glucose or sugar or carbohydrates. Well, all of those are the energy for the mitochondria. And the mitochondria convert that into energy that our cells use, the mm -hmm. ATP. Right. So, okay, the mitochondria then are important. What are they? Well, the mitochondria are found in all living things, including plants. They were in dinosaurs. They're in every animal, every animal. In plants, what they do is they convert sunlight in, into a type of starch the plant needs to survive. And they are a vestigial bacteria. Vestigial means they're not functioning as a bacteria anymore. They are in a symbiotic relationship with our cells that allow us to be multicellular organisms and evolve. When exactly this happened isn't known, but I mean, the dinosaurs 
had uh, mitochondrial DNA. Right, right. All right. So they are extremely small. These are very, very tiny. They carry their own DNA and they replicate. They multiply on their own because they have a lifespan like everything does. So in, in our body, every cell has the mitochondria to produce the ATP that the cell needs to survive. Some cells have a thousand of them. Most cells have three to 400. So you're talking about something really small. An average cell, yeah. brain cells, like one ten thousandths of an inch. A brain cell, one yeah. ten thousandths of an inch. And in that brain cell is five or 600 of these mitochondrion. <laughs> so you're talking true. about a really tiny space. Yeah. Well, as an organism, they carry their own DNA. Their own DNA is in a perfect circle, as opposed to human DNA, which is all wound up in a yeah. double helix. It's like yeah. taking two rubber bands and twisting them around. And as you twist two rubber bands of the human, they pull together and it's like a clump. Yep. And the little pieces of the clump are chromosomes. They're called chromosomes in, yeah. in, in the literature. All right. But with mitochondria, it's just an easy circle. They decided that what we're going to do with these, with these samples of the Native Americans where they're getting their human DNA, the nuclear DNA out of the cell, we're going to also get their mitochondria and take a look at it. And we're going to see what's happening to the genetics of the mitochondria. Now, at the time, they thought all mitochondria had the exact same DNA. They thought they were all the same. All right. Mm -hmm. So they tested these Native American tribes and they found a few genetic things in the human DNA to that might account for some of the uh, obesity and, and the other issues they have. They still haven't worked out how to fix it, though. I, I got to say that. And that's kind of sad. But anyway, they found that there were different versions of the mitochondrial DNA, distinctive versions, and they called them haplogroups. Yeah. And a haplotype. Now, the word haplogroup simply means uh, a specific type. That's all it means. Mm -hmm. So there's several specific types. And you get this, you get this mitochondria, all of it. It comes from your mother. It does not come right. from your father. So it's in people talk about it as your mother's DNA. Well, it's not really your mother's DNA yeah. because it's it's just simply you're getting all the bacteria in your body that became the mitochondria came from your mother because you have the egg. And then you have a sperm, which is a single cell, which is not necessarily a single celled organism, but it's carrying its own mitochondria. But as soon as the sperm enters the cell, the mother's, the mother's, the mother's immune system recognizes that mitochondria that's coming in with the sperm as something foreign, and it destroys it, leaving behind only the female mitochondria, all right? Gotcha. The mother's mitochondria. So when you grew up, you have, you have the mitochondria from your mother. Whoever your kids are, they're not going to have your mitochondria. They're going to have your wife's or your girlfriend's right. or whoever's mitochondria. And that's why it's called maternal DNA. Gotcha. All right, so that's important to know. We're, we're only tracing the female side with mitochondria. So what they figured out found four distinct types. They weren't expecting that. They thought this simple DNA of this bacteria, it, it's very simple, that it would just, they'd all be the same. They all, yeah. you know, they look the same. Why wouldn't they all be the same? But they're not. So they named them, they logically, let's call them uh, A, B, C, D, haplogroup A and B and C and D. And so interesting, great. So they decided, well, this is very interesting. I wonder if this, this is where archaeologists got in. I wonder, since we know that all of the Native Americans came from Siberia and Asia about 12,000 years ago, which is what they believed in, all of them, they all came from Beringia then. I wonder if we went over to Siberia, got with the indigenous people, tested their mitochondrial DNA, yeah, I'll bet right. it would be the same. Gotcha. So they went over. They then, now this is all in the early 90s, 94, 95, yeah. this all went on. So they tested them and lo and behold, they found they had haplogroup A, they had haplogroup B, I'm sorry, A, whoop, C, and D. They did not have B. 
And that was a little confusing, but they hailed that as absolute proof that all of the Native Americans came from Siberia. They said, well, we'll find B eventually, or maybe they all died out there. We don't know. So other people got interested. Loads of studies came out. Then suddenly a study came out, and haplogroup B, as it turns out, is in Taiwan. Haplogroup B is in Asia, but mainly Taiwan is really the center of haplogroup B. And then they found like in Australia and New Zealand, whoa, haplogroup B came from Taiwan. The indigenous people there have some sort of connection to, high, to Taiwan. So they made the trek yeah. from that part of Asia all the way down to Australia, New Zealand and Samoa, all of those islands and so on and inhabited them. So that was the answer for haplogroup B. Archaeologists immediately said, well, obviously, what they did, some of the bees, is they just went north and they went all the way up around. They got into Siberia and they came around too. So we've just proven they all came from there. 1997. Well, okay. So in 1994, Emory found, they found a couple of samples that didn't seem to match anything, mm -hmm. A, B, C, or D. And they just called them unknown. They said, we don't know what the heck this is, but there's only like, Initially, there was one sample, and maybe, maybe they sampled one that had genetic damage. They thought it just, you know, there maybe there was something wrong. So they shoved it to the side in the study, and they called it other unknown. Right. Nineteen ninety-seven, they started doing two things. They started testing lots of Native Americans, and then they found that three percent of them had one that wasn't A, B, C, or D, and it matched the other unknown. And the other unknown, they decided, well, we, we don't know what the hell this is. And when we went to Siberia, nothing was found and when uh, that matched it. And when they went to uh, like Taiwan and Australia, New Zealand, nothing matched it either. Let's just call it X. <laughs> As in X, the unknown, yeah. which is, I mean, a, an amazing coincidence, because at the time they didn't realize when we test people all over the world, we are going to find 32 of these things. We're going to find 32 major ones and go through the entire alphabet. And then we're going to have to make like haplogroup A, A1, A2, right. A1, A, A1, B, A1, C, A1, C1, and C2. Yeah. And just keep getting all of these little subgroups and subtypes, subclades. So, I mean, it's just, it's bizarre. So they called it X. And so as they went, as they found more and more and more and more, haplogroup X is the only one in the world where they can't find the origin. Mitochondrial DNA is a time machine. It's the only one that allows us to do this, that, that we have right now. We know how often it mutates. We know that it has a mutational rate. They used to think it mutated very slowly. Now it mutates incredibly fast. And by that, think of this. There's a major mutation in it roughly once every 7,000 years. Mm -hmm. And over millions of years, that gives you a lot of chances for mutations. All right. So and the, the subclades might mutate a lot faster than that. But there's a major mutation once roughly every 7,000 years. And this is all calculated in the scientific literature. It gets amazing. So in all of these others, they dug up, well, all right, the next piece of the research, let me get in and I'll get back to that point. They started this, they decided that we can match where it came from by digging into cemetery remains, ancient remains. And the older the remains are, we pull those bones out, we pull the teeth out. Mitochondrial DNA is so simple and so durable that some of it can be tested from dinosaur bones that have been in the ground for 75 million years. Great. So might it, so they take human remains, they've taken human remains. The, the easiest areas to test out of the body is not getting it out of the bones, get it out of the teeth. You can get it out of the teeth pretty easily. And so they started doing this like in Europe. We had huge samples at the time all over the Americas because archaeologists had dug into thousands and thousands of mounds and had literally millions of skeletal remains in storage all over the place. So people doing dissertations and, and master's theses and so on, they're the ones that did lots of this research. 
they started testing these remains that were held in storage. And they found that some of the mounds in North America, half of the remains in them, there's some mounds there that have thousands of remains in them. There were thousands of people buried in some of the mounds. Half of them had what was called haplogroup X. X, mm. so it was very big. And it's all concentrated in the Northeast. 3% of living Native Americans have haplogroup X, 3%. 40% of the mound remains in the Northeast have haplogroup X. And this is why it's in that book. Well, Edgar Casey said that the Atlanteans were the red race and they started the Iroquois and all that and went in and, and merged with them. And so I got to thinking, well, I wonder if haplogroup X is Atlantean DNA then. And we yeah. actually published the first, I think it was 1998, we published that in an ARE uh, journal that came that we were editing along with uh, John Van Auken, who's on that. Uh, so it's not done yet. So in Europe, they found in the Basque region. The Basque are mount, is a mountainous region between Spain and France. Uh, the Basque people speak their own language, which is bizarre. It's not spoken anywhere else. They have their own very strange customs. Uh, and in the Basque region, when they started testing skeletal remains pulled out of cemeteries that were like 8,000 years old, they found haplogroup X. Now, here's what's interesting. In his readings, Edgar Casey said that huge numbers of the Atlanteans in 28,000 BC fled to the Basque region. 28,000 BC. Wow, Atlantis yeah. had three destructions. First okay. one was in 50,000 BC, and a whole bunch of Atlanteans, some of them came to South America, some of them went to. Um, different areas in Europe. Some of them went into Egypt and into the Gobi Desert. That's how the Gobi fits into this. And then in 28,000 BC, there was another destruction and loads of them then went to a couple places. And one of them was the Basque region. And the last one was 10,000 BC. We've already talked about. Yeah. So the Basque had haplogroup X. And then as the research got better, they found that, okay, some of the haplogroup X people came from Europe. The European haplogroup X is, is type one. It's A1. Native American haplogroup X, the subclade now, initially all they called was haplogroup X. They didn't know there were going to be all these subclades and all these other mutational variations of it. So they found that is, is haplogroup X1. So it didn't quite make sense. There's something else going on. Now, where there's another thing that fits here that we didn't actually, we're not, we're the first people that said this and wrote it, but we weren't referenced in this when um, a guy from the Smithsonian and a very famous archaeologist theorized that the Clovis culture entered America from Europe around 10,000 BC. And then, so what started happening is the skeptics attacked it and said, that's right, white supremacy, white supremacy, because you're mm -hmm. saying European. Andrew Collins is one of the people, and me are two of the people that have said that uh, the Salutrians, that's the culture, the Salutrian culture, which centered in France, Southern France and Spain, around 16,000 years ago, that that culture disappeared or actually moved a bit to the uh, west and north around 14,000 BC. And they, we are certain now, were haplogroup X. And so uh, Dennis Stanford and from the Smithsonian uh, wrote several books. I mean, this is all, it's very controversial and archaeology has been split by this. And it's an extremely contentious argument between them. Uh, and it, it's the thing is, the Salutrians weren't white. And that area wasn't called Europe at the time anyway. Yeah. And so th they're grabbing and saying, oh, you're saying Europeans came over here. So they were white and they weren't white. Uh, Andrews actually followed the movements of the what is known as the Salutrians. And they came uh, from parts of Asia, they were probably, um, uh, 
more, they were probably closer to people that uh, today we consider to be the real Mayans, uh, the actual uh, Central American survivors of, the, of their Holocaust uh, and so on. They're probably more similar to them, but they clearly weren't white. Uh, so yeah. anyway, that is haplogroup X. Uh, it matched what Casey said. That's why it's there. Uh, haplogroup B matched Edgar Casey because haplogroup B, remember Casey said around 50,000 years ago, a group of, a large group of people came from the South Pacific, came up and moved into South America. That's haplogroup B. South American cultures are loaded with haplogroup B. North American, not so much. It's a very small percentage in North America. It's more than haplogroup X. Gotcha. So yeah. that's kind of it. I've explained some really deep stuff here in just a few minutes. I know it's going to leave people confused. No, yeah, that's that's what I was going to say is that, I mean, anyone who is confused definitely needs to pick up your book, Mound Builders, as well as some of the other books that you've mentioned, where you go way more into detail about this. Yeah, stuff. Like you I need said, some depth on this. Yeah, I've yeah. still got a couple chapters left in the book. And, you know, I know that there's there's still some explanations for some things to come. Um that, you know, even I'm a little confused about it just because I haven't read that far. So I do suggest everybody to pick up Mound Builders, give it a read. And uh, of course, look at any other, you know, books regarding mounds in Atlantis uh, and Edgar Casey in general that uh, you and, you know, your fellow co-authors have worked on. But yeah, I think we've given the audience probably too much to, <laughs> to <laughs> yeah, I know. look into, but I mean it's like information overload the amount of um i guess information that's that's out there that i guess you guys are presenting it, it it's almost disingenuous that it isn't being i guess looked at seriously by well, any, any the, other reason yeah okay so let, let me make a point here this genetic stuff very few people understand genetics very very few and it, it's very complicated but when you hit, when you see this genetic stuff like 23andMe and some of these other, other companies right. that will test your DNA, they are using exactly what I'm talking about. And they're taking all the evidence that's published in now tens of thousands of articles and they've accumulated all this information. So you'll hear how they're saying that these people, we know these people came from here and we know their movements. I have described to you how they figured this out. It's literally by testing the living, but also testing the dead. And when you True. test the dead, you have the exact location where they died. You know, in American mounds, those people died very close to here. They're not bringing them from thousands of miles away. So we know here's where they lived. And so you pull that DNA and you match it to yours, for example, to know if, if, if you match it. And then they take their DNA out of those burials and they can match it to DNA from burials in other places and look at how it's mutated and see if this one came from this one. And they have really matched a lot of this now. And it's unreal. It's hard to keep in mind. It's really hard to keep in mind uh, how all this plays out. But that's how they're doing it. It's taken all this evidence from the DNA collected from skeletal remains and living remains and now they're getting it from lots of people that are paying them to do it. You know, you're yeah. paying them a hundred dollars to test your DNA. Exactly. And I mean, technology is only going to get better. So, I mean, yes. there's only going to be more and more information that comes out about this stuff. And I guess uh, if anything major comes out, then I guess I've got your number and I'm going to have to have you on again to talk more about some genetics and stuff. Yeah, um, well, yeah. we'll try. <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, it's a ton. It's, we've already talked. Well, about I know it. Yeah, this but, new book uh, with Andrew, there's a new one coming out, like I said, in May. Um, that's one that uh, will, that's got to change things a bit. Uh, there's not a lot of DNA in it, but let me tell you, it's got some really different things in it. Uh, and I don't really want to go too far with it. We've tried to yeah. be very cautious because it's take, it's been in the publisher's hands. The completed thing has been in the publisher's hands for nearly two years now. We're moving in on wow. two years. And that it's been the pandemic that has slowed it down. So we're being cautious about not giving out too much information Absolutely. because some of it's going to cause quite a stir. Uh, yeah. And the stir is going to be, I'm putting in it, I've put in it, Andrew's put some astonishing things in it. The, the, some of the most interesting stuff I've ever read about UFOs and aliens 
and the paranormal. And what I've put in it is about what the Native Americans believed about the paranormal and how they manipulated it and where we came from and why we are here. That's what's in that Very book. Interesting. And I'm looking forward to talking about that when I can, but I can't. I'm not allowed to talk about it till yeah. it comes out. Well, you guys heard it right from the source. When this book drops in May, you have to get it. I know <laughs> I'm going to have to get it and I'm going to have to read it immediately. But <laughs> with that well, being said, um, Greg, Dr. Little, thank you so much for coming on the show. I mean, I you always teach me something new, and I know the audience is going to highly enjoy this discussion that we had. And I mean, they've got a ton that they need to look into. I've got to finish this book. And uh, yeah, thank you so much again. But uh, is there anything you wanted to plug for yourself? Anything no, coming they, up? I love that. Well, coming up now, the Mound Encyclopedia is a big deal. People that the book Path of Souls has this genetics in it. It has the updated genetics, Path of Souls. And actually, I don't think I put one thing about the genetics in the Mound Encyclopedia. That's a book that has 900 mound sites in America and a lot of others that are um, in America that aren't visitable. But it, it's it's a guidebook to all the mounds and and. I'm working on an update on it, the third edition, uh, probably be two years before it's out. And that may be my last big project. I don't know. Gosh. I'm getting up there in age. I, my first hey, book came out in relax. 84. That's a long time ago. 84. Wowzers. But yeah, yeah, it's time. It's time for you to take a break. Time to relax. Time to go to time huh. to go to Bimini and just enjoy the beach, you know? Yeah. <laughs> OK, I got you. Well, it's a pleasure. Hang on for a minute after we uh, close down here. Yeah, talk to absolutely. You a but uh, thank you, uh, Greg. I really appreciate it. And we'll talk to you later. All right. Bye bye, folks.